Welcome to the Anxious Love Coach Podcast, the place to be to create meaningful, conscious, secure, long-term partnerships. Here we talk relationship anxiety, relationship OCD, and creating healthy dynamics with your partners so that you can experience that secure, loving connection where you both feel committed and confident. My name is Natalie Kennedy, and I'm your host. I'm a relationship anxiety coach and meditation teacher. I've had a practice for nine years working with clients battling anxiety. And after experiencing an extraordinary shift in my own healing relative to relationships, now work to combine my personal experience as well as my training to help others trust themselves within relationship. I've been to the edge and back with my partner from my own relationship anxiety and have come out the other side, feeling consistently blessed and at ease in my partnership. I want to pass the tools I've learned along to you to help you trust yourself in relationships and also create magnetic dynamics with your partner. Our partners are our mirrors designed for our expansion, and the challenges exist generally to wake us up to ourselves, not destroy our beautiful partnerships. I believe most mainstream relationship advice today can be a huge source of anxiety and dissatisfaction. So let's jump in and normalize the challenges that we go through, call out the limitations of today's messages about love without being old-fashioned, and awaken our intuition and wisdom. Hello, my dear friends. It's so nice to be back. In the episode today, I would love to (laughs) share some new experiences, new insights that are mm, extremely vulnerable to share and simultaneously really, really relevant. I'd like to talk about if you ever find yourself attracted to the same sex, I want to be selective about the words that I choose to use. Um, If you experience a form of relationship OCD called HOCD, which is homosexuality OCD, I hope that you will find the experience that I am intending to share today helpful. That said, I just want to offer the disclaimer, in case you don't already know, that I'm not an OCD specialist. I am not even a a licensed therapist. Everything that I share on Instagram, on social media, and on this podcast comes from my own personal experience as a woman in a long-term relationship with a man. So take what I say with a grain of salt. My intention is to share experiences that I hope are helpful for you, but know that this isn't coming from a like clinical perspective. When I'm speaking about the experience of OCD, I'm not speaking in terms of a disorder. What I'm usually intending to do is speak more about the symptoms from a very human perspective. I realize that a lot of people, um, you know, I I definitely don't want to cause harm by saying that I know everything about OCD because frankly, I don't. But at the same time, a lot of people who experience OCD relate to the very symptoms that I described that I had and largely overcame. So I hope that you can take that distinguishment, that's a word I made up, (laughs) and find what I'm going to share with you today useful because in the last month I've experienced some new experiences, some new emotions, some new circumstances that on the surface really freaked me out. But thank goodness I run a business that kind of holds me accountable to do the work. (laughs) Every time I have some kind of relationship problem, there's a little voice in the back of my head that's like, oh, this would, if if we can get to the bottom of this, like this would be gold and this would be wonderful inspiration. So I just am very humbled and grateful that as you listener actually listen to me ramble, not to be self-deprecating, but seriously, I don't actually know with full certainty where this episode is going to go. I don't have a printout mainly because I just had a sense that it would flow today because, because I don't know, because, because I was lazy, but I also think you're going to get a lot out of this. I would like, I'm specifically going to speak again 
from my experience as a woman. I think that if you are a woman in a relationship with a man and you've ever found yourself attracted to another person that identifies as a woman, I think that you maybe will be able to relate to the experiences that I share today. Some of you might not, and that's okay too. One of the things that we teach in in our programs is that we can all have totally different experiences that are all really, really valid. So I'm going to speak to people who've had this experience and normalize it and share with you what I got out of that experience so that if you've had that experience of being attracted to another woman while in a relationship with a man, that you can relate to this. And if you are a man in a relationship with a woman, this can maybe help you understand how many women's minds and bodies work, how female arousal works, how female sexuality works. And if you're non-binary, you can find elements of this that apply to you. I'm not sure which elements will apply, but I trust that we're human. Sexuality is complex and fluid and that there will be something for everyone here. I really trust it. But for the sake of simplicity here, I'm going to be speaking in terms of men and women just so that I don't have to make a bunch of disclaimers every single time I use those, those obviously, um, binary terms. Okay. So ah, let's talk about freaking out. <laughs> If you are a woman who found yourself drawn sensually, potentially, (laughs) to another woman while being in a committed relationship with a wonderful man, if that is you and that has happened to you, this is going to be a delicious episode for you, I really, really hope. So a little bit of backstory uh, for me personally. This year, in 2022, every year I make a list of of things I'd like to accomplish and and phrases and words that I'd really like to embody. And, And one of the things that was important to me is to really work on my relationship to my sexuality. When I was in my late teens, I had a voracious sex drive, voracious libido. When I met Preston, we were very into each other. You can take what you like from that statement. (laughs) We were very active. And then life caught up with us. Um, Preston went into a really intense job. I went into a really intense job, a bunch of responsibilities piled up and the naturally occurring sex drive that used to exist kind of diminished, especially on my end. And for a really long time, this was in part what contributed to my relationship anxiety. I had this enormous guilt over my lack of uh, attraction to anyone, actually. And and obviously, I would say this to Preston, and it really didn't make him feel better. I'd be like, baby, don't worry. I'm not just not not attracted to you. I'm not attracted to anybody. And I I really, I hated that. I I just felt like a, a, a vessel of a human being. And if you listen to episode one of my podcast, I really did get my zest for life back. I did start experiencing bursts of uh, attraction for people and for my partner. And, you know, after doing a lot of the practices that we teach in our programs, both one-on-one and our group program for women that we have right now called Both Feet In, which is still open for registration, by the way, through these practices that we have shared with others, I've really largely gotten my fire back. But in 2022, I decided that I wanted to take this to a new level I wanted to improve my my desire. I wanted to improve my connection to my what we're going to call my yoni. Um, yoni is a really lovely term to describe the <laughs> the parts where the sun don't shine, as my great teacher uh, Shana, Shana Hiller describes it: the vulva, the vagina, the uterus, the cervix, the woman's private parts. So today I'm going to be referring to this area as the yoni. You can refer to it as other parts. I'm not going to say vagina because that actually only refers to one little part of this magical area in a woman's body. So we're going to refer to it as the flowery area of the yoni. I wanted to develop a stronger connection with her. I'm going to refer to my yoni as a she because she behaves like a she. (laughs) She's got a life of her own. And I really wanted to, to heal any potential, potential, uh, trauma that I might have sexually, not even caused by my partner, but to me, sexual trauma can be as, um, 
as severe as assault, it can also be uh, internalized shame around our sexuality. So, you know, that that's obviously on the less, the very, very low extreme in comparison to something like sexual assault or rape or something like this. So, but for me, it was just, uh, I, I actually started really realizing I held a lot of tension there. Um, sometimes during intercourse, there could be pain, there could be dryness, and I just really wanted to really give it a shot. So, um, some of you guys might've heard my podcast with Lucy Lamp. I actually hired her and, and work with her one-on-one, um, and have been taking up certain practices like, uh, Jade Egg practice. I started doing, um, more sensuality based practices. I started doing a lot more movement and sound and embodiment. And at the end of 2021, last year, I actually booked a, solo retreat to Costa Rica for um, a wonderful mentor and yoga teacher of mine, who, by the way, has also been on this podcast, um, specifically speaking about the very thing we're going to talk about a little bit today. Her name is Shana Hiller. She is a yoga teacher and yoga teacher business coach and mentor. Um, and she also recently in the last year has gotten her Tao Tantric Arts training and has largely healed a lot of her own woundings around her sexuality and femininity and feminine sexuality. And so she hosted a retreat this past week, a week and two weeks ago in in early March in Costa Rica. And this year I decided to sign up. So when I say I was serious about really getting to know my sexuality and reintegrating my, my feminine sexuality, I was serious. I have invested literally many, many, many thousands of dollars to kind of demonstrate to this scared part of myself to connect with my yoni that like we're doing this in 2022 where we're really getting to know <laughs> Natalie's sexuality. So, oh, what an amazing retreat. We did a lot of practices that were not just centered around like looking at your yoni and touching it and uh, being, having <laughs> crystal eggs received by it and improving your sensitivity and like pelvic floor lifts and stuff like that. But it was also learning how to be in sisterhood. Your connection to your femininity includes, uh, as a woman, includes your connection to your yoni. And it also is related to your connection with the feminine within yourself, what, whatever you perceive to be feminine and your willingness to be expressive of those things. Um, it's about any internalized misogyny that you might still be carrying around, which I I had some and I still do, and sometimes I'm not even aware of it. Um, but it also relates to how you relate to other women, including the concept of motherhood, the concept of your own mother, your concept of sisterhood, and if you have kids, likely your relationship to uh, your daughters or your nieces. So it's all related. And, um, I, I, I do have, you know, I have father wounds. I have mother wounds. I also have sister wounds and, um, any sister wounds that I had came up over this retreat because I looked at 18 of these other women and I saw each of them as my sister and anything that was unresolved, like showed up. So it was very challenging for me. Any, anything that was unresolved with my mother surfaced there. Anything that was unresolved with my sister showed up there. So it was just very triggering in in some respects to actually look into women's eyes and really linger in their gaze and linger in their their beingness um, and linger in their softness and linger in their wildness. Uh, and, And in the same way that I struggle to sometimes be accepting of my own wildness and feminine nature, I struggle to accept that in in others. And yet I desire to be connected with those things so, 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 so much. So (laughs) I want to, one of the things that we learned on this retreat is the difference between sexuality and sensuality. And I had heard before that they are not the same, but I had never put in the effort to distinguish the two. And I think that, um, my understanding of this is sensuality does not have to be sexual at all. Sensuality has much more to do with your ability to experience sensitivity in terms of sensation, as well as 
pleasure that doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. However, most of us associate, I I can't say most of us, but I think many of us do associate pleasure with sexual pleasure. But I, I, my definition has changed after this retreat. It's, it's quite exquisite. So let's talk a little bit about receiving. And I'm going to give you an example of how we were taught to practice receiving at the retreat. So we were partnered into groups of three and four, and we were instructed one at a time to be the receiver while the other women would be the givers. And we were instructed to, as the receiver, to name our desires, fears, and boundaries for this like three to five minute interaction. So for example, I knew right off the bat that one of my favorite things is like platonic touch, friendship touch. And so I wanted to lay in a woman's lap while she braided or played with my hair lightly and just like twirled my hair around her finger and to just lay on her lap and have her like play with my hair. I wanted the other women to potentially put a hand on my heart and just breathe and linger there. I wanted another woman to maybe just run her hands softly up and down my arm. Okay, so notice like these are like really, really specific, um, which means you have to know what it is you want and you have to speak it, something that is a very valuable skill, uh, not just in this exercise, but in the bedroom and with your partner. It's not enough to say, love me. (laughs) I want you to love me. It's like that could look a thousand different ways to a thousand different people. To me, in that moment, love and receiving would mean lying on a woman's lap while she plays with my hair in a slow way. Um, And my definition of slow might be fast for someone else, so you have to like really be specific. One of the things that my teacher Shana had us do is name our desires, fears, and boundaries for the interaction. So my desire would be, I'd love to have one of you play with my hair. I'd love to have one of you touching my arm. I'd love to have another one of you with the hand on my heart. My fear is that uh, a boundary is going to arise during the act and I'm going to bring it up and maybe offend one of you, or I'm afraid that I won't speak up because I don't want to hurt your feelings and then I'm going to feel violated. My boundary is that you don't touch my yoni, you don't touch my boobs. Okay. Those were mine. And each woman, as it became her turn, had her own desires, fears, and boundaries. And so it was really wonderful. Now, there was a woman, and she does not know that I'm making a podcast about her. (laughs) Mary, I love you so much (laughs) if you end up listening to this. There was a woman named Mary um, that I met at the retreat. And when it came time for her to do... Mary, I hope you're okay with me talking about you. (laughs) I just realized I never asked her. Oh, well, nothing is going to get shared. That's too crazy. (laughs) Okay, here we go. Let's do this. We're just going to dive in. Um, When it came time for Mary's turn, she's a a lovely Austrian woman, and she requested something called Krebola, which is now one of my favorite words. And it's it's an Austrian, like German word for um, light, feathery touch. And so she requested Krebola all over her body. And it was, so we all gave Mary (laughs) Krebola. And it was the first time in my life that I had, I had witnessed a woman receiving so fully and without reservation. And I was just like, holy shit. (laughs) Wow. It was so inspiring because so many women I know, including myself, when they receive, they don't take the time to really receive it. It's like they have to bounce it back somehow. When someone gives you a compliment, you don't take the time to let it hit the center of your heart. You bounce it back. You say, oh, thank you. You're beautiful too. (laughs) You know, like, oh, don't say that. Like we never take the time to really just digest the compliment or digest the gift and be like, oh, yum. Thank you. Thank you for that compliment. Thank you for that gift. Oh, look at these flowers. Wow. Oh, you think I'm beautiful. I am beautiful. Thank you. Wow. That feels so good to receive. Watching Miri receive her Krebola and just like exude the pleasure that that brought her, it, it, it changed something for me. 
I was like, I've never seen a woman receive so freaking well. And I, I had to look at my own beliefs around receiving. Um, it can almost be triggering to watch a woman receive without giving anything back. <laughs> I, uh, it made me realize that I have, I had this unconscious belief that if I receive, I must give something back or else I'm selfish and narcissistic. Um, in, I realize that this is not true because Mary was by far one of the most generous women I have experienced um, a, a, in a friend. And it's probably because her capacity to receive is so big. Therefore, her capacity to give is also equally as big. So initially, <laughs> and then Miri and I, uh, because we like we had such a wonderful connection during this particular exercise and um, I noticed that my guard came down. Um, I stopped being so frightened of women as, as the week went by. I started giving crebola to a lot of women. When I, when we would walk by each other, we would touch each other's arms. When we giggled, we would touch each other's shoulders. And, uh, it, I just, I didn't realize how hungry I had been for non-sexual, physical, female friendship, innocent touch. Um, I didn't realize how starved I was for that. It was almost like a primal communal experience. And when I started getting that need met for touch from women in a non-sexual way, I started freaking out because of how much I enjoyed it. And I was thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I am like, I knew I was, I, I was pretty sure I was bi because I found myself craving touch from women so badly. Um, and as soon as I started getting this, this desire, this need met, the amount of pleasure I got out of it was so big and such a relief. It, it scared the shit out of me, to be honest. Um, but I also knew it would be very good podcast content later. So it just, it, throughout the week, we did a lot more of these very intimate practices with each other that were touch based. Um, there was an exercise where we were supposed to wear an article of clothing that we normally wouldn't wear, and we put on a performance in that outfit for other women. Uh, you can imagine the kind of outfits that some of these women put on, and it was just exquisite to watch women in their power, not tearing each other down, um, whooping and hollering and laughing. It was just so primal. It felt like we were all part of a village. Um, there was this deep knowing that we all had. Um, Shana, this is the best friggin' uh, unsolicited testimonial <laughs> ever. <laughs> Your retreat was amazing. It was exquisite. And I remember watching Mary in her outfit and I was just like, oh my gosh, she's so gorgeous. Oh, and I was like drooling. <laughs> we were all drooling over each other. Um, Mary was drooling over me. I was drooling over all the women because they were so beautiful. I remember having this moment of being like, oh, I understand why men are so mesmerized and confused by women. We are so fucking cool. We are so fucking powerful and beautiful like physically, emotionally, spiritually, women are so worthy of reverence. Like I wanted to bow down and kiss some of these queens that were dancing in these outfits and just makeup and no makeup and um, lots of clothes or very little clothes. It was just all so beautiful, different archetypes of women, women displaying their anger, women displaying their angelicness, women displaying their slutness, women displaying all these different complex sides of themselves and just witnessing them and seeing the beauty in all of it. And it allowed me to embrace my own different sides of being a woman. And it made me so fucking proud, you guys. Uh, if you're a woman listening to this, I hope you know how fucking powerful you are, how fucking beautiful you are. Mother, daughter, sister, wife, woman. We are so amazing. <gasps> I'm getting chills just, just thinking about it. But <laughs> that experience created a simultaneous fear because um, I noticed just, just wanting to caress, wanting to kiss the cheeks. And um, I decided to 
to text Preston and be like, yeah, I think I love women. I don't know what to do. And he's like, are you guys having an orgy? Uh, do you have a, and I'm like, no, <laughs> we're not having an orgy, but there's definitely a lot of like sensual touch happening here and lots of, mm, like we all, we all started being a lot more vocal about our pleasure. If something was delicious, we moaned with pleasure. We just like, mm, this is so good. Uh, we cackled loudly, we whooped and we hollered and, ah, uh, like we just didn't hold back on making sound. We didn't hold back on uh, letting ourselves breathe more sensually and just think about how well behaved women have been conditioned to be in society where we have to be quiet and we have to be reserved and we can't let our hips swing side to side too playfully or too much and we can't be too wild and then we wonder why we're so fucking anxious because that's not how we're meant to be i'm not linear i'm i i I like to sway my hips i like to dance i love to scream i love to sing and you know where does that fit in in a society that's so focused on looking good i don't know but i it made me really understand how suppressed we are um, emotionally and, and how, how difficult it is to really feel safe. So after the retreat was over, I was going to go to Monteverde because I love birds. That's why we have cockatoos as our logo on the podcast. I love birds. If you ever go to Costa Rica and you like birds, Monteverde is your place. And I was going to go alone until Miri came up to me and was like, Hey, (laughs) I heard you're going to Monteverde. Can I come? And I was like, I don't know if I should spend time alone with you. (laughs) Oh my God. But I I trusted that the universe was winking at me in some way. And I was like, yeah, I'd love it. So we went to Monteverde and we ended up just having a very sisterly time. And, you know, we, we hung out a lot. As soon as we arrived, Mary was like, Hey, I'm going to be changing in front of you sometimes. I hope that's cool. Like, you're probably gonna see me naked. And I was like, that's fine. That's actually so weird that we need to say that. It should just be a given. Like, what is it with us being so weird about being naked around each other? We have the same bodies. Like, just imagine like the the kind of world we live in that we have to hide that, you know? And it, it was, we, I had like this pain in my neck. And so she gave me this wonderful massage and she had these like cupping things and this Shakti mat, which is like an acupuncture-ish type mat. And it was, she gave me a two hour freaking massage, just lingering over like painful areas in my back. And then I returned the favor. We would take walks and we'd link arms and it was just lovely. And what I discovered by the end of it is that this, this desire, um, that I had had and this, this wanting to, to kind of be with women in a way, it came to an end. There came a point where I was like, okay, I'm actually satiated. I realized that there actually never came a point where I wanted to go beyond feminine platonic touch, but because I hadn't given myself permission to actually get that need met, for many, many years to the extent that I wanted it to be met, aka being in a a group of 18 women where we all touch each other all the time, where we kiss each other's faces and we hold hands and we giggle and we laugh and we change in front of each other and we get naked um, and we see each other naked and it's not a big deal and we just hang out in like this primal way. Um, Because I hadn't had that need met for so long, I was perceiving that my hunger for that meant I was a lesbian or um, wanted women sexually. And while that may be the case for some women, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with that, I discovered that I don't actually want, at least not at this time in my life, sexual relations with a woman. I'm fortunate that I have a partner that is open-minded enough for me to engage with women in a playful, platonic, and physical way where massages are okay, back massages are okay, changing in front of each other is okay, uh, walking around naked in front of each other is okay. Heck, I go to Korean spas in, in Orange County all the time. But um, my partner doesn't see that as a threat. And to be honest, neither do I, because there's there's no there's no sexual relations happening here. This is just something that I think 
was meant to always be natural. Women are touchy, we're sensual, we like to make noise, we're wild, we're communal, we're relational, and we're meant to connect with each other. There's a reason we call it sisterhood. You know, I think a lot of us really want to sit around the fire and howl at the moon. Like I have that, I have that desire. I think a lot of women do. I don't think we're crazy for wanting that. But yeah, so you'll notice I didn't talk a whole lot about like HOCD. Part of that is because I don't think I'm qualified to to speak on OCD. I speak on the symptoms that many people have uh, that some people qu- qualify as, um, you know, some people might call OCD, but I just want to share from my personal experience. There was a point where I really panicked thinking, am I gay? And uh, I think it's, th- that question implies a yes or a no. That question is a very black and white question, and it kind of demands a black and white answer when I think the answer is actually a lot more gray and a lot more fluid. And I think we ought to realize that um, female sexuality, female sensuality is on a spectrum, and actually sexuality in general is on a spectrum, and it's really not as black and white as I think it's made out to be. Um, I texted my coach, Lucy Lamp about this. I was like, why am I suddenly drawn to women to this degree? And she said, and I agree with her sometimes. Yes. We women discover that they actually would like to be in a relationship with a woman. And a lot of the times it's actually a side of ourselves that we've been missing for a long time. And when we find ourselves drawn to women, um, it could be that it's a part of ourselves that's longing to be reintegrated. In my case, it was a primal desire for what sisterhood is really intended to be and to be connected to the sacred that is the feminine sensual connection. Um, it's, it's, (sighs) I realize if you, if you, if you're a woman and you don't have relationships like this, Um, part of me wonders if you're going to think I've gone off the deep end, but I think most of you are going to understand what I mean when I'm talking about the innocence of wanting to cuddle with your girlfriends while they play with your hair and you do tarot cards and watch a movie together and giggle about the stupid things that men do sometimes. It feel, it felt so sacred to me. And if you are worrying about whether you are gay First of all, you're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, Whether you want to be in a relationship with a woman, that's fine. If you want to continue being in a relationship with a man, um, but deepen your connection to other women through intimate and uh, platonic innocent touch, through massage, through playing with each other's hair, um, through holding hands when you go to the mall, you know, I think that is totally valid too. Examine if you're actually getting that in your life. Um, not all women desire platonic friendship touch though. Um, but I know I do. And now that I know that that's a need, um, I have come back to the States deliberately figuring out how am I going to get that need met? Because let's face it, the, this world is not super cuddly. Um, it doesn't make it easy for women to have platonic sensual touch. (laughs) You have to go out of your way to, to do it. I texted a few friends and I was like, Hey, can we arrange a massage exchange? Can you massage me once a week? And I massage you once a week or something like this. Um, when you come over, can you massage my hands? When, when you come over, would you feel comfortable? Um, you know, like cuddling on the couch while we watch a movie. Is that weird? Unfortunately, my friends are weirdos and are like, I would love that. (laughs) Oh my God, that would be so cute. Can you go to a Korean spa with your girlfriends? Like, are you comfortable seeing each other naked in this primal, like normal way, this non-sexualized way? Can can nakedness be non-sexual? Can we just be animals? Can we be humans? And well, there was another point I was going to make, <sighs> but it's gone. Ah, um, I remember when I was young, I used to go to the banya. I'm Russian. My family's half Russian. 
we used to go with our great grandmother, grandmother, mother, me, sister, we would go to the banya, which is like the bathhouse. And we would all be naked. All the generations would be naked. We would be in the sauna and we would beat each other with birch branches because it's really good for your circulation. And that was normal, familial. It was non-sexual and it was in hindsight, very sacred. And I'm so glad that I got to have that growing up and, and have that that experience normalized for me. I think it was very important to experience that level of intimacy and to experience intimacy in a way that isn't sexual. Um, intimacy and sex are not the same thing. There are many different kinds of intimacy. And it's it's kind of unfortunate that we only have that one word, intimacy. Intimacy with your father, intimacy with your mother, intimacy with your sister, with your friend, with your girlfriends, with your client, with your partner. We all use the same word love and we use the same word intimacy for all these different types of experiences. Whereas in other languages, we might have different words to describe those things. Does that mean that uh, people who speak English doesn't don't have different experiences for each of those types of relationships. No, but we only have that one word. So it can create a lot of confusion when, you know, you say, or oh, I'm being intimate with my girlfriend. And, and, and by girlfriend, I mean my friend who is a girl. Well, we don't typically say that, but it is intimate. Intimacy is into me, see, into me, you see. Um, we can have intimate relations with people that are not our partner not necessarily in a sexual way. And this retreat really demonstrated that for me. So um, examine in your life, if you are a woman and you don't have close friendship, close girlfriends in your life, like go get some. And if you have some, find the ones who are a little more open-minded and a little more witchy and a little more weird and ask them if you can cuddle with them. Ask them if you can lay on their lap while you watch a movie. I think a lot of people don't bother naming these desires out loud. They think that they're crazy. I don't think you're crazy. I think we're all secretly just tired of pretending that we don't want to be touched or that we want to be touched, whatever. I hope it makes sense. So I just want to normalize, like if you, if you desire to have a more intimate relationship with women as a woman, I don't think you're crazy. And if you do decide you want to be in a relationship with women, that is okay. That is so okay. And there are so many different paths, so many people who have made different choices. There's no right or wrong way. That said, I am just very grateful to have a male partner who is confident and trusting of both himself and me and lets me have the level of freedom that that I desire. And as I said earlier, Um, When I let myself fully embrace that this side of me does exist and is allowed to have her needs met, I learned that I actually really don't want to be in a uh, romantic relationship with a woman. I had no desire to make out. I had no desire to grab any tits. I had no desire to touch any yonis. Quite the contrary, I reached a, a level of satisfaction of fullness as if I'd eaten a really nourishing meal, and I returned to my partner ready to jump him. So that was really cool to witness. It's almost like, huh, when you meet your own needs, you don't need them as much anymore. And some of you guys are going to hear that and think that you need to go cheat on your partner in order to decide if you really want to be with them. I remember being in that place. Don't take, don't always take every desire at face value. At face value, I, I was worried I wanted to be in relationship with women. Under the surface, I wanted a deeper connection with the feminine and the sacredness that is femininity, but it did not require me leaving my partner and totally swinging the other way. Sometimes it does, but in my case, it didn't. (sighs) so I hope that that has been helpful before we close up I'd like to give you a few changes I've made in my life to connect with my feminine side so I have been practicing when I see women and I hang out with women including like Preston's mom throughout the house I actually like just started gently 
touching as she walks by. I started having a little bit more intimate conversations with my girlfriends, making more specific requests around touch. Hey, would you play with my hair? And something I started doing is I, after every single shower, a lot of you might do this already, but I never, and I did it sometimes, but I only did it on like special days. If I had like a date or I was going to go tango dancing or I was going to go to a concert or something like this, but I've actually started to do this now after every single shower is to oil up after every shower. And I actually started to have a very specific butter that I use for my breasts. There's, I think there's a brand called Banyan, B-A-N-Y-A-N. It's an Ayurvedic brand and they have a like breast butter. I don't think they call it that, but it's like this rose and geranium butter and it is made with ghee and some people really hate it. Miri did not like it when I was like, here, try this breast butter. She did not like it, but I like it. My aunt recommended it actually. And it is lovely. In my opinion, the texture is amazing. But if you hate ghee, you're probably not going to like it, but I do. The second thing um, I started doing is uh, I actually started oiling my yoni after every shower. This is a game changer (laughs) because I love going into my day feeling clean and slippery. I oil not just my yoni, but I actually uh, oil my butthole. So that is one of the most intimate things I've ever shared to the entire world. So, uh, you're welcome, but it makes a really big difference. You guys, it really does. I love how I feel. (laughs) It's like I'm in on some inside joke. It's like I go to the grocery store after taking a shower and I'm like, it's like, nobody knows that I oiled my butthole today. I'm going to share with you what I use to oil my yoni and my butthole and also the lube that I use when I am intimate with my partner. And if you want to buy it, I get a little bit of money, which is really fun. I use Foria, the Foria brand. Um, I actually have my own code, believe it or not. So hmm, here's like a little ad. It really is an awesome product. I use it all the time. I use it for my jade egg practice. I use it for oiling my yoni. I use it for oiling my butthole. Um, I've said butthole way too many times on this podcast. And yeah, they, they use CBD in it, which is a really nice. They have a lot of, they actually have some suppositories that you can put up your vagina. If you have menstrual cramps, it helps me a little in conjunction with some other tools like a heat pack and everything. I, I used to get cramps really bad. It's gotten a lot better over the years now that I'm spending more time resting and less push, 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 go, go, go. But if you want to check out Foria's website, um, they're awesome. I love their arousal oil, which is really great for clitoral stimulation, but I also use their lube, which is just really nice to oil up and also get ready for sex. Mm -hmm. So, um, I have my own code. It's anxious love coach 20 and you can get 20% off, which is amazing. So if you go over to foria.com, you can use my anxious love coach 20 at checkout and you get 20% off your first purchase. And I also get a little bit of money, which is so fun. I've never gotten paid from the podcast. So, so buy, buy their stuff. And, and I get to, I don't know, go to the grocery store and buy like a bag of sun chips or something. I don't know. I, I don't eat. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I love sun chips. They're so good. So anyway, <laughs> all those, I, I, I do, I do swear by their, their product is really, really good. I've practiced swaying my hips a lot more. I've practiced oiling my my body every single shower. I've invested in some higher quality uh, shampoo and conditioners because it makes a really big difference. Um, I use Away, O-W-A-Y. I don't have any coupon code for that. Sorry, they're expensive, but really good. Better quality lotions. I also started... I I invested in a really nice towel, a towel that is extremely pleasurable to dry myself with, a nice robe, some slippers so that I don't have to walk on the cold tile. Like really going out of your way to make your experience with your body a lot more luxurious. Um, It doesn't have to be expensive, but it does need to be more intentional. Even if it's just having like a fuzzy pair of socks, how can you make things more pleasurable for yourself. So here's a list of things that I've, I make a list, a pleasure list. I wrote one down saying, here's how I'd like to make 
life more pleasurable for me. And I've been following through on this. Um, for me, daily sound and movement. That means getting on my hands and knees and like ironing out any, unwinding any kinks in my body. Um, obviously oiling every day, lotioning up. Um, I'm committed to spending some solo nature time um, once per week. Um, I'm actually going to keep my eyes open um, for some new flowy dresses. I've decided I'd like to wear less underwear because that feels very restrictive to my yoni and I want to let her breathe the air just like I let my nose breathe air. So what can I do so that I, don't, I can wear less underwear? Well, I can buy some longer flowy dresses. So I can either buy them or I can raid my mom's closet and say, Hey, are you not wearing any long, are you not wearing any long flowy dresses? Less underwear, less bras. Ah, oh, feels so good. Feels so lovely and luxurious and goddessy. Um, I like to go to the Korean spa twice a month. After the pandemic, it's more expensive, but fortunately the one in, in Orange County that I go to is very affordable. Setting up a massage trade with some friends. I'd love to create a women's circle in Orange County. If you live in Orange County and um, you're interested, shoot me an email or um, or DM me on Instagram. Uh, I'd like to get some flowers weekly. I'll spend like five bucks at Trader Joe's and get myself a little bouquet of flowers every week. It just brings so much joy. Or you, you can even pick some flowers if you have some growing nearby. I'd love to see a sunset every week or a sunrise. So these are just some ideas that I have on how I can make my life more pleasurable. I would love it if after listening to this podcast, you make a pleasure list and you can ask yourself the question, what can I do to make life 1%, 10%, 50% more pleasurable? How can I indulge my senses? I taught yoga for seven years and there's this whole like principle on like not letting yourself get carried away by material pleasures. And I think that's really useful for people who are extremely materialistic, but a lot of us can take that to to the extreme where we don't allow ourselves to really enjoy life. (laughs) I know I did. Um, So I'm actually relearning now that actually we're here on this planet to have fun and be in bliss. And a lot of that is letting yourself savor, letting yourself linger in pleasure, letting yourself receive because In doing so, you're going to have so much more to give, and you're also just going to be a way more fun person to be around. So make a pleasure list. Ask yourself the question, what can I do to make life more pleasurable? Write out that list, take a picture, and send it to me on Instagram. I would be so honored. And also, it would give me some ideas because I'm really committed to this. Um, I've noticed that through this practice of focusing more on my own personal pleasure, I'm way more generous, less bitchy, my PMS is not as intense. I'm nicer to my partner. I have more sex with my partner. I desire more sex with my partner. And interestingly enough, the more pleasure I receive, the more pleasure I receive. So it's like the more pleasure I get, the more radiant I feel. And the more radiant I feel, the more pleasurable experiences naturally come to me, which is such a cool thing to observe. So that's all. I hope that Um, this has been helpful. Like I said, I didn't really talk a whole lot about obsessing. I just really wanted to, and, and, and and fear and panic and HOCD. I just, I really wanted to normalize this experience of wanting to have, if you're a woman, wanting to have more connection with other women. (sighs) So that all just magically downloaded itself through me. Thank you, universe, whatever came through. I hope that this was beautifully helpful for you. And I hope that my computer wasn't too noisy in the background. I cleaned the fan out, but it's still kind of whirring loudly. In either case, thank you for listening. If you are a woman and you would like to join our six month women's group program for women who are experiencing relationship anxiety, you don't have to be in a relationship with a man. You don't have to be in a relationship at all. But if you notice you're kind of one foot in, one foot out on your romantic relationships, um, this is a program for you. At the moment, this is just for women, mainly because there is a lot of um, vulnerability and practices where we partner you up. And generally, women feel safer being vulnerable um, over Zoom with other women. So that's the only reason. And also, I, I just, as a 
as a woman, I tend to understand women better. I am working on my understanding of men, uh, but it is limited. So I work with what I know. I try not to speak on things I don't know about. This is what my strength is. Um, but I hope in the future I will have more to offer. In the meantime, there are a lot of other people out there speaking on relationship anxiety who work outside of my niche. And uh, you should check them out. Chelsea Horton at uh, Healing Embodied, Alex Bishop at uh, For Love We Heal on Instagram, and Kiyomi and Alexis at Awaken Into Love. These are all great resources. Cheryl Paul. And yeah, and, and I'm sure there will be more coming, but this is, this is where, uh, this is where as far as I can go for now. So if you are interested in joining Both Feet In, we have started. We started in, in February, but it's still open. Uh, the nice thing about this program is it's, it's open. It's just, you can join anytime. It just means you have to catch up a bit, but there's no urgency to, um, have to catch up immediately. And it's actually centered around our menstrual cycles, which is so fun. So there's a lot of time, there's times for pushing and times for more intensity. And then there's times for sweet, sweet rest where Sheridan and I, my co-coach, we don't work, which is really delicious. Ah, so if you're interested, head on over to anxiouslovecoach.com and um, you can find our page on both feet in and you can register right on there. Otherwise, we uh, we have some one-on-ones available. I have avail- availability to take on one six-month client. Sheridan has her own program as well. And we still have an online self-study course if you're interested in something lower budget and also with less of a commitment. Relationship Anxiety Alchemist is also such a really, really great option. And that's all. That's all I got. That's the end. <laughs> I hope that you have... A wonderful day and that this reaches you at a good time and that this lands in a really, really yummy spot inside. So thank you so much. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye. If you love anxious love coach, please leave us a review every month. I will be choosing one review, posting the username on my Instagram page and offering that person a personalized voice message response to any question of their choice via private message. Thanks for listening to the Anxious Love Coach today. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to hit the subscribe button, leave a review, and follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Please also subscribe to my email list at anxiouslovecoach.com as I'm trying to reduce my reliance on social media. In exchange, you'll receive my free relationship anxiety meditation and a ton of information that I won't share to the general public about my personal challenges and learnings within relationship. If you would like to work with me, and or my co-coach, head on over to my website and click start here. Thanks for listening and catch you in the next episode.